Hello, I'm Ruth Goldstein. I'm chief of ultrasound at UCSF, University of California, San Francisco. Uh, today we're going to talk about the standard obstetrical sonogram, how the AIUM guidelines can help you do a good job and stay out of trouble. Today we're going to talk about the standard obstetrical sonogram and the AIUM guidelines and this lecture should also be entitled How to Do a Good Job and Stay Out of Trouble. Uh, the first question when you talk about standard obstetrical sonography is usually should we be doing uh, OB ultrasound as a matter of routine during pregnancy? and uh, to answer this question, the NIH Consensus Conference uh, convened in 1984 and the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology again in 1988, and all agreed that OB ultrasound should be done for only very specific indications. Uh, of course, they uh, produced a list of these potential indications that were extremely long and included just about anything you could think of as an indication for an obstetrical sonogram. And uh, truth be told, in the year 2008, the majority of pregnant patients who get prenatal, prenatal care in the United States uh, get at least one sonogram during their pregnancy, and many get two or three. So we'd like to talk about the guidelines for, for performance of the uh, standard obstetrical sonogram, and these were these are practice guidelines that were first published in 1996 and have uh, undergone multiple revisions, the last one of which uh, has been published in October of 2007. And I've lift listed the URL for you in case you would like to uh, reference this. Importantly, uh, they describe these guidelines as a reflection of what the AIUM, the American Institute of Ultrasound and Medicine, considers the minimum criteria for a complete examination, but they are not intended to establish a legal standard of care. So what these guidelines uh, offer us is, one, a standardized protocol which helps us perform complete and accurate study. And they also establish reasonable expectations both for the patients who undergo these examinations and also for the referring doctors. And uh, I have to say, like it or not, uh, these guidelines represent the groundwork for the quote unquote standard of care, especially in the United States. And uh, these guidelines are invoked in almost every uh, legal case in which uh, someone feels that the proper uh, standards have not been followed. So let's talk about this standard obstetrical sonogram. And just briefly, uh, we call this in our lab the level one examination. And that's distinguished from the targeted sonogram in our lab called the level two examination which requires considerable addition, additional effort to the standard obstetrical sonogram. The targeted exam is really tailored to risk uh, elevated alpha fetal protein and abnormal outside sonogram with a certain finding, a history of diabetes in pregnancy, uh, drug exposure, et cetera. And because it is tailored to a specific risk, it is not a standardized exam, and that is an important distinction from the standard OB sonogram, which uh, for all intents and purposes really should be the same for every patient. So the guidelines are, as expected, different in the first and uh, second and third trimesters. In the first trimester, uh, very clearly stated is our obligation is to identify the appropriate and true location of the gestational sac, to uh, confirm the presence or absence of embryonic life, to measure the size of the embryo and the crown rump length measurement, to determine the number of uh, fetuses or embryos, 
and finally to look uh, carefully at the uterus, including the cervix and the adnexi. And uh, transabdominal imaging in the first trimester, in my view, is sufficient, as uh, is written in the guidelines. Vaginal imaging uh, is only PRN or as needed. I'd like to just talk for a moment about the location of the gestational sac and the uterus and adnexi. Of course, the cervix uh, imaging is not all that terribly important in the first uh, trimester, but it is important because it ensures that you have connected the central uterine cavity to the cervix. And in this way, you can show that the gestational sac, as you see on your uh, right here, is connected to the cervix. It is the central uterine uh, cavity. And I like to remind people that the cervix should be imaged so that you don't make the kind of mistake that was made in this image in which a perfectly normal looking embryo with a heartbeat was identified on vaginal scanning, but the person who did this, and granted it was late at night and they, the patient was from the emergency department, they pretty much just wanted to get the exam over with, uh, failed to recognize that there was an empty uterus adjacent to this gestational sac, and this represents an ectopic pregnancy. So the cervix is uh, included uh, just as a nice little reminder that you have to connect the central uterine cavity or the place where the uh, gestation is located to the cervix to confirm its intrauterine location. The presence or absence of embryonic life is an important uh, one, and of course, heart motion is uh, the uh, best evidence of life in the first trimester, and this is a real-time diagnosis. You can see the heartbeat in the first trimester embryo. Um, I believe that we should only do vaginal scanning if it is uh, necessary to see the embryonic heart motion, and I don't believe that Doppler nor M-mode are necessary for making this diagnosis. I think it's simply a matter of observing it. We documented it in Cineclips, which is very, very helpful, and uh, the communication with the sonographer uh, that the heart motion was evident is an important thing before we uh, used to store Cineclips, before we had the capability of storing Cineclips, we used to have our sonographers write uh, positive embryonic heart motion on the image. In most cases, heart motion is detected as soon as you can see the embryo, and as you see in this image, it can sometimes actually be seen before there's a measurable embryo. Um, but it may not be visible uh, before the embryo reaches five millimeters in size, and this is why the caveat of uh, the size caveat is included. Don't diagnose a demise of the embryo until the crown rump lake gets to be five millimeters. And this is included mainly to ensure that you don't uh, call a normal pregnancy abnormal just based on the absence of a heart motion, absence of heart motion based on a very tiny, almost indiscernible embryo. Wait till it uh, reaches a size of five millimeters before you call it a failed pregnancy. The crown rump length, this is really the mainstay of gestational age assessment in the first trimester. We're quite accurate. We can usually estimate gestational age within five days, and uh, this is using crown rump length measurement. Actually, it's best between six and 12 weeks or so. When you get into the 13, 14 week, you're kind of in that gray zone between measuring uh, actual head circumference and biparietal diameter compared with a crown rump length. Uh, if your main goal in performing obstetrical sonography is to determine gestational age, then this is the time you want to do it. However, if you're only going to perform one sonogram during gestation because you get so little morphologic information, and as we'll talk about, uh, you will get almost as good dating information a little bit later on, uh, this is probably not the greatest time to do a gestational age assessment. 
In the first trimester uh, in 2007, the guidelines have an additional comment about the nuchal region, and this region um, can be abnormally thickened in association with chromosomal abnormalities. And the guidelines indicate, if possible, the nuchal region should be assessed as part of a first trimester scan. And that is merely to get you to notice if the nuchal area is abnormally thickened. And I think any uh, nuchal fold area, and this is not written in the guidelines, but it's my opinion that any nuchal fold area greater than about two and a half millimeters should probably refer, be referred to uh, a nuchal translucy screening program. And I want to emphasize that individual aneuploidy risk, uh, an individual woman's aneuploidy risk for a particular present pregnancy is best determined by nuchal translucency screening programs, which are very uh, stringently quality controlled and uh, very careful measurements are correlated with the crown rump length and an individual risk can be offered to the woman. In the standard obstetrical son sonogram, the one that's performed for dating or that's performed for uh, vaginal bleeding, uh, you will not make an individual aneuploidy risk based on the nuchal uh, appearance. Now the fetal or embryonic number is another important part of this examination. As you know, twins are all considered to be high-risk pregnancies, but some are higher than others. And uh, not only is it important to report the number of embryos, uh, this, is, this is obviously a very important thing to the parents to know if they're having twins or triplets or what, whatever, uh, but the chorionicity is absolutely critical to be both observed and reported in the first trimester, and that would be done on the basis of either a thick intervening uh, membrane, which is the chorionic membrane, versus no thick inter intervening membrane, which would be a monochorionic uh, twin gestation. As, as you know, chorionicity, moreover than the number of, of fetuses, is are in there, chorionicity is much more important than knowing whether there are just twins or triplets. So very important thing to do. Let me just go back to that for a moment. Uh, I would say definitely take the opportunity. Complications can arise from monochorionic pregnancies later in gestation, and it is absolutely critical when you talk about uh, how you may manage these problems, including twin-twin transfusion or selective intrauterine growth restriction or even an anomaly based on the chorionicity. We, we make our management decisions based on the chorionicity. It's much easier to handle a dichorionic twin gestation with uh, a problem in one than it is a monochorionic due to the shared uh, blood supply. So in the second and third trimester, the guidelines uh, are ex the the inclusions in the guidelines are expanded somewhat for obvious reasons. Now we're going to talk about not only fetal life, number, and presentation, but amniotic fluid volume becomes important, the location of the placenta relative to the cervix, the estimation of gestational age and growth and weight, probably the cornerstone of the standard obstetrical sonogram, the uterus and adnexa, again important as part of this examination, and the specified a specified fetal anatomic survey. We will take these uh, in turn. Let me also say that in the United States, of course, we uh, are required to, to store a permanent record of our images with the date, the name or identifier, a written report in the medical records, and all of this are according to the American College of Radiology Communication Standards. Uh, amniotic fluid volume can be assessed uh, both subjectively, uh, more qualitatively, as well as using semi-quantitative methods. The semi-quantitative methods would include deepest vertical pocket 
or the amniotic fluid index. Of late, the amniotic fluid index, particularly in singletons, has become very popular, and it's quite easy to do. The uterus is simply divided into four quadrants, and the deep, deepest quadrant, deepest pocket, excuse me, in each quadrant is uh, measured in centimeters. Uh, those are summed, and the total is the amniotic fluid index. And uh, there is some variation uh, with gestational age, but as a general rule, uh, normal is considered uh, somewhere between 5 and 20 or 24 centimeters, depending on uh, what you, if you like to be specific or sensitive. And I can't emphasize enough that the amniotic fluid index, while it is a number and we do make a numeric or quantitative assessment of the fluid, it is really not a precise number. And the most important part of uh, the recommendation to assess amniotic fluid volume uh, is that the extremes of amniotic fluid volume are associated with poor outcomes. So it's really the extremes when you get into the over 20 centimeters for amniotic fluid and less than 5 centimeters that you're going to be looking for the causes and potential association with uh, problems in pregnancy that can be managed and intervened upon. Polyhydramnios is usually not a very subtle diagnosis. Basically, you've got the fetus swimming in a sea of amniotic fluid. Subjectively, if the abdominal wall doesn't fill the uterus in the AP dimension, you're kind of suspicious there may be uh, polyhydramnios. But usually, if you have severe polyhydramnios, it's, it's not difficult to diagnose. And of course, uh, we've looked at this a number of ways and have determined that the greater the polyhydramnios, the greater the risk of a fetal anomaly. So if you see something like this, you would be thinking of twin-twin transfusion with a monochorionic pair, and one with polyhydramnios, the other with oligohydramnios. You might be thinking of high gut obstructions, such as esophageal or duodenal atresia. And finally, anything with overperfusion, sacrococcygeal teratomas or things like that. Severe central nervous system anomalies uh, can sometimes produce very severe polyhydramnios. But in today's practice, most commonly, those are uh, diagnosed earlier before polyhydramnios uh, develops. And in these cases, if you see polyhydramnios, I think that's a very good indication for what we call the level 2 obstetrical sonogram or the targeted obstetrical sonogram. Similarly, too little fluid, known as oligohydramnios, is uh, bad for two reasons. One is it's bad for fetal development. For the lungs to develop, you need adequate amniotic fluid. For the limbs to develop without contractures, you need adequate amniotic fluid. But per perhaps more importantly, uh, from a diagnostic perspective, oligohydramnios may be the first uh, suggestion that there is an uh, fetal anomaly, and that will lead you to look more carefully at the fetus. Uh, and because basically the differential when you see severe uh, oligohydramnios is that she's ruptured her membrane, she has premature rupture of membranes, that there is a dysmaturity syndrome such as post dates or intrauterine growth restriction uh, going on. Or finally, and most importantly, that there is a GU or genitourinary malformation. And for this, I would go directly to the fetal urinary bladder. If there's oligohydramnios and the fetal urinary bladder is large, as it is in this particular case, there isn't any fluid anywhere in this uterus except for the fetal urinary bladder. Then, of course, you would be thinking of uh, bladder outlet obstruction, and in this case, with the typical keyhole appearance, you would make the diagnosis of posterior urethral valves. If you go to the bladder after you've made the initial diagnosis of oligohydramnios and you see the two umbilical arteries coursing around the urinary bladder, but there's no fluid in the urinary bladder, then you're talking about bilateral renal disease, most likely. Uh, 
and you look carefully in the renal area, if you see a picture like this, you will make the final diagnosis of multicystic dysplastic kidneys, which in this case are bilateral. Of course, in order to have oligohydramnios be and an empty bladder be ca caused by a renal abnormality, it must be bilateral. Okay, a unilateral multicystic dysplastic kidney and a normal kidney will not produce oligohydramnios, and they will not produce an absent urinary bladder. A unilateral multicystic dysplastic kidney and contralateral renal agenesis, which is a much harder diagnosis, will cause absent urinary bladder and uh, oligohydramnios. So it's very important once you see an absent bladder and oligohydramnios to look up in the flanks and see if you can make the diagnosis. Regardless, in the second trimester, if you have absent urinary bladder and severe oligohydramnios, the prognosis is extremely, extremely poor. The placenta location and its relationship to the cervix is a key part of the standard obstetrical sonogram. In fact, uh, placenta previa has got to be one of the most important causes of maternal and fetal death in the developing world, and this is a very important part of our uh, diagnoses in uh, the even in the developed world. Um, and for this, we must, one, be able to identify the placenta, and two, identify the edge of the placenta as it relates to the internal cervical os, as well as the ipsilateral cervix and contralateral cervix. Cervix, and what you want to become familiar with is the position of the urinary blat, the position of the cervix. Excuse me, at the first turn of the urinary bladder and its relationship to the edge of the placenta. This is uh, not that uncommon of an image, and what this represents in pregnancy, for whatever reason, what this represents is a typical false positive diagnosis of placenta previa. So here you see the placenta for all intents and purposes. This very much looks like the uh, cervix here, but it's not really at the first turn of the urinary bladder, but you see, uh, if you look carefully at this, you can appreciate that these are lower uterine segment contractions, and in fact, uh, the cervix is way down here. So let's just look at that one more time, because this is a very common phenomenon in the second trimester of pregnancy. You get these Braxton Hicks, or kissing contractions, as, they, as we call them, and for whatever reason, they're really trying to fool you. They, they contract and oppose each other, simulating the endocervix, as you see here. But be aware and be very uh, careful about finding the true cervix. If you're getting a measurement on the cervix of five or six or eight centimeters, you know that no normal woman has a cervix measuring eight centimeters. So be aware that it may be elongated and you may be do dealing with lower uterine segment contractions. And the more you're aware of that, the more it becomes clear uh, what the anatomy of the cervix is. And you can see it very nicely here, the first turn of the bladder, the cervix here, here is, here are the lower uterine segment contractions. This cannot be a placenta previa because as these resolve, this placenta is going to go right like this. And if it truly were attached to the cervix, you couldn't get a contraction between the placenta and the uh, endocervix. The cornerstone of the standard obstetrical sonogram, as mentioned, is pretty much the estimation of gestational age, fetal growth, and weight. Uh, and for this purpose, we uh, measure certain parts of the fetus, the biparietal diameter, the head circumference, the abdominal circumference, and the femur length. And we put these measurements into a regression equation uh, which emphasizes the head and femur length to, to produce a gestational age uh, assessment. 
And we use a slightly different regression equation to produce a fetal weight estimate. That regression equation, the fetal weight regression equation, most heavily emphasizes the abdominal circumference. So the same biometry is used in both uh, equations, but one in the case of the gestational age assessment, the uh, femur length and head size are most heavily emphasized, and in the fetal weight uh, equation, the abdominal circumference is most heavily emphasized. And the reason for that is that when you look at the correlates of weight and size, it turns out abdominal girth most co closely correlates with uh, fetal weight. For the biparietal diameter, we are going to look for the uh, third ventricle here and the thalami, and usually the cavum is included, and we will measure outer to inner. Um, for the head circumference, as you know, we go all the way around the circumference of the uh, cranial vault, not to include the thickened scalp if it is present. In the femur, we want to measure the osseous shaft of the femur and be cautious about not including the distal femoral point. You can enhance the estimation of gestational age by two to three weeks by including this uh, specular reflection off the distal femoral condyle. The best way to measure the femoral length is to uh, be in a plane perpendicular to the shaft of the femur. Then you know, and if you line that up and you actually see the two femoral condyles, the proximal and the distal femoral condyles, you can measure the bony shaft and the bony shaft alone. The abdominal circumference should be obtained, again, in the outer circumferential way uh, at the level of the stomach and the right, ventric the right portal vein. Here you see the right portal vein and the left portal vein. This is the so-called hockey stick appearance. That is the plane of section you want to include for your abdominal circumference. And usually the machines will take your measurements and correlate with a nomogram in the machine stored in the machine to a certain gestational age. It takes that regression equation again and calculates the sonographically estimated gestational age and the estimated fetal weight. You will put in, the based on the last menstrual period, the estimated due date based on her clinical dates, and it will, the machine will take this measurement of estimated fetal weight in grams and compare it to the clinical age and give you a percentage, and that is to say, if this fetus were truly 28 weeks, six days, and it weighed 1393 grams, what percentile would it lie in? And the answer to that in this particular case is 55. Now the accuracy of predicting gestational age is pretty good uh, throughout gestation because two standard deviations is plus minus 8 percent. But you see as you go farther in gestation because the number of weeks that the baby is uh, are greater than 8% becomes a larger error. Uh, and that's why we usually teach that third trimester sonograms are not very good at estimating gestational age, whereas the crown rump length, which is a very small number of weeks, uh, can estimate to, you know, within about five days. So, Technically speaking, crown rump length is the best way to estimate gestational age, but second trimester sonography between 14 and 21 weeks does a very good job as well, and you can see 8% turns out to be within 1 to 1.5 weeks. Therefore, if you're going to do it at one, if you're going to do one sonogram during gestation, you might as well do it in the 18 to 20 week period of time because you're going to see all of the important anatomy and you're not going to really sacrifice much in the way of dating. Okay, estimating fetal weight is good, but it's not quite as good as estimating gestational age. And if we had to put a number on it, we would say instead of uh, one standard deviation being, instead of two standard deviations being plus or minus 8%, uh, 
uh, two standard deviations are now uh, 15 to 20 percent. And again, uh, regress regression equations that calculate estimated fetal weight will emphasize the abdominal circumference. So this is a technically important part of the standard obstetrical sonogram. Let me just uh, show you ways in which you can mismeasure the abdominal circumference. Here's a textbook measurement of the abdominal circumference in the proper way, the hockey stick, right portal vein, the stomach. Here's another one that was used as an abdominal circumference, but you see the stomach here, but instead of the hockey stick, you see an elongated uh, left portal vein. What is the difference in the measurement of this versus this? Well, the answer to that is that this image increases the size of the abdominal circumference because instead of being axial through the abdomen as you would be if you saw a portal vein in this uh, appearance, you are uh, more angled through the abdomen and if you see an elongated portal vein and therefore you would overestimate the size of the abdominal circumference. Just a small technical issue uh, that I wanted to remind you about in your measurements of the abdominal circumference. Now, in the first 20 weeks, the size of the fetus pretty closely reflects gestational age. And the rare exceptions to this are very severe early intrauterine growth restriction, which fortunately is rare. Uh, and second, a chromosomal or severe uh, fetal anomaly in which the fetus will be small for dates based on the anomaly. But as a general rule, most of us grow pretty much the same in the first 20 weeks. In the second half of gestation, uh, the size of the fetus will reflect both the gestational age of the fetus as well as the growth pattern of the fetus. And growth by growth pattern, I mean uh, both the placental sufficiency or insufficiency, the environment of the fetus, and also constitutional issues, so that if you're, both of your parents are 6'3", you would probably tend to be a little bit on the large side, large size in the third trimester compared to someone whose both parents were five feet or five foot two. So the uh, percentage of the percentile, the LMP percentile, becomes actually quite important in the second half of gestation, whereas it's not so important and sometimes it's hard to obtain in the first uh, half of gestation because the charts really don't go down that low. It takes a very big alteration in growth to demonstrate uh, an alteration in the LMP percentile. That's not really the case in the second half of gestation. The second half of gestation, the uh, centile, according to the clinical dates, becomes very important, and this becomes more of a reflection of normal growth of the fetus, as you see in this particular case. Um, it compares the generated weight of the fetus, based on your fetal biometry, to others of the same clinical age, and this is a very important concept. So. I'm going to repeat it in a couple of different ways. Um, you look at nomograms of all fetuses of a similar clinical age, or some people call that LMP age, and you say, how are they growing when they're 28 weeks or when they're 29 weeks or 31 weeks? You say, okay, the 50th centile is around this, this weight, the 25th centile is around this weight, the 70th centile is around this weight, and you compare it to nomograms. You compare your generated fetal size to those nomograms. So look at a case uh, like this. This is a nice example of what might happen to you in the interpretation of sonograms. Here's a fetus who, by dates or by quoted uh, due date, is supposed to be 33 weeks, but she's a little bit hesitant about her uh, LMP and, you know, there's just a sufficient waffling where the sonographer might say, oh, well, she's not really sure of her dates. 
and we look at the fetal biometry that's obtained in this particular case, and we have a 20, 28 and 6, 29 and 1, 27 and 2, and 29 and 1. You're thinking, geez, all of these are about four weeks less than her stated dates. Maybe she's just a month off in her dates. But this is a very important uh, problem and one that I would strongly recommend you don't make. If you see LMP centile less than the 10th centile, you should think of intrauterine growth restriction and res resist changing menstrual dates. This particular fetus is dying in utero. This particular fetus is living in what they call a hostile intrauterine environment. The placenta is not supporting this fetus's growth. If you do not recognize that this fetus is chronically hypoxic and growing abnormally, this fetus will die in utero before it can be delivered. On the contrary, if it is delivered early, it may suffer some of the effects of prematurity, but it will be alive and they will be able to nourish it much better out of the womb than in, of the, in the womb. This is a growth-restricted fetus, a very sick baby. Now, the guidelines recommend if previous studies have been performed, appropriateness of growth should be reported. And this is a very important part of your job in the standard obstetrical sonogram. If prior studies have been performed at your location, at your institution, you need to compare your results to them. I don't think it's necessary if the images are hard to find or whatever uh, to necessarily look at every single picture that was taken in a prior exam, but there should be a report that's available to you. It should be clear what they used as her due date, what they used estimated gestational age, what the sonographic due date was, and you need to make a comment about the interval change from one study to the other. I can't tell you how many lawyers have come to me to discuss this particular issue. If prior studies have been done at your institution, you need to compare the current exam to the prior one. And importantly, the pregnancy should not be redated after an accurate earlier scan has been performed and is available for comparison. That means if an 11-week sonogram was done at your institution and they generated a due date, and she comes in and says, I can't remember when my last menstrual period was, but it was about, I do remember on my first sonogram that it was about three weeks discordant from what they found on the sonogram. You must compare it to the first sonogram and you should never redate her based on the current sonogram. So later sonograms are not as accurate at dating as earlier sonograms are. Always use the earlier sonogram, and if the earlier sonogram is not available, always use her clinical dates. She will always remember what she was told as her due date based on her first trimester, either physical exam or sonogram. This was uh, another very uh, interesting example and I think illustrative example of this uh, point precisely. This is a patient who was referred to us for a potential short limb dysplasia. The patient was very, very anxious because uh, the doctors at the outside site had told her that she m may be having a dwarf. And according to our information, she uh, was 24 weeks uh, based on an early sonogram. But she said the early sonogram wasn't uh, very good. It was just done in her doctor's office. And in fact, according to this, her femur length was uh, 20 weeks, which was four weeks discordant with what she used as her stated dates. But look at the rest of the fetal biometry. 20 weeks was the femur length, 20 weeks was the humeral length, but 
all of the other measurements were similarly smaller than her stated due date. So the femur wasn't all that short compared to the abdomen and the head, but all of the measurements were very short compared to what her stated dates were. Now, when she told me what her due date was, which was August 8th, she uh, said that this was a generated due date. She could never really remember her last menstrual period, no problem. It was generated based on a six-week sonogram in the doctor's office. She said, well, he doesn't have very good equipment, which just sounds like someone scratching their nail on a chalkboard to me. A six-week sonogram is great, regardless of how bad the equipment is. You would have to really make a mistake confusing a six-week pregnancy with a nine-week pregnancy uh, based on a first trimester. The difference in appearance between six weeks and nine weeks is the difference between a grain of sand and a blown up balloon. It is uh, very obvious and is unlikely, regardless of how, quote, bad, the end of quote, uh, the equipment was for imaging in the first trimester, it's very unlikely her doctor would have made this mistake. So if we had based our uh, conclusions on the biometry alone, first of all, we probably wouldn't have called a uh, dwarf, but second of all, we would have missed the opportunity to make the diagnosis of very early and severe intrauterine growth restriction. So my recommendation uh, to you is there are three ways to always stay out of trouble. One is always ask her LMP date, okay? It doesn't cost you anything to ask when her last menstrual period was. If she doesn't remember it, which some don't, ask her what they told her her due date was. Women often forget when their last menstrual periods were, but they do not forget about their due date. They've informed everybody, all their relatives, about when the baby is due, and even if it's off by a day or two, they remember their due date. And if she's had a prior sonogram at your center, you are really obligated to compare it. The worst mistake is miss missing a growth disturbance because you changed the dates or were negligent in, in comparing your current sonogram with the first sonogram done at your institution. And if all else fails and there's discrepancy in what her true dates are and what you think her dates are, simply report how you determined her due date. This will allow the doctor who may glean additional information at a later time, her referring doctor, uh, to adjust the uh, percentile, the, the clinical percentile of her fetus uh, at a later time and allow you to do it as well. So you have relinquished responsibility for determining her due date as, as soon as you report how you determined her due date and it's available to the referring doctor. Okay. The standard obstetrical sonogram also includes a very specified and uh, thoughtful uh, fetal anatomic survey with attention to important areas that are highly reflective of um, some of the commoner fetal anomalies. And I've indicated the uh, new inclusions in the guidelines in blue for you. These are new since the year 2007, but you're probably familiar with most of these. In the head, you want to look at the cerebellum, the choroid plexus, the cisterna magna, the lateral ventricles, the midline echo, which in some cases is the interhemispheric fissure, in some cases the falks, the cavum, uh, septi pellucidi, the lips. Lips are a new inclusion and the lips are included not because uh, clefts represent uh, life-threatening abnormalities, but they're often associated with other anomalies that can be better assessed at a later time. And also it's very humane uh, for the parents to know ahead of time if they are having a fetus or a child with a cleft uh, lip or palate. 
In the chest, uh, you want to make sure that you get a four-chamber image of the heart and, if feasible, outflow tracts. I would strongly recommend those. In the abdomen, the stomach, not just the presence, but the size and the situs of the fetus, the abdominal cord insertion into the fetal abdomen. The genitourinary tract, you want to look at kidneys and bladder, the umbilical cord, the number of vessels, and insertion into the fetal abdomen again. Uh, people have varying opinions about where is the best place to look at the uh, number of vessels in the umbilical cord. Personally, I think it is uh, uh, very sufficient just to look at the cord insertion into the ventral abdominal wall and see two arteries coursing around the fetal urinary bladder. Uh, this gives you a very easy assessment of a three-vessel cord. Uh, there are situations in which it can be three vessel at the ventral abdominal wall and two vessel elsewhere, but these are clearly the minority and the exceptions. And I think if you're going to use this as sort of a standard exam, a screening exam, uh, you should look at the fetal abdominal wall. The cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral spine should be imaged and uh, assessed. The extremities, legs, and arms basically just to determine the presence or absence of them. And the genitalia, while this is uh, often uh, information sought on standard obstetrical sonograms, is really only medically indicated uh, in low-risk pregnancies if there are multiples. So if you're trying to to confirm monochorionicity, for example, you would want to show that uh, both fetuses are of the same gender. The lateral ventricle can be assessed quite nicely merely by identifying choroid plexus filling the lateral ventricle wall to wall. The posterior fossa, I like uh, simply to look that, that uh, determine that there is a cisterna magna, this little bit of fluid has no, or high, no higher brain function, but it nicely outlines the biconvex uh, nature of the cerebellum it surrounds. And finally, the cavum septi pellucidi is a reflection of forebrain development without uh, a corpus callosum forming. Primarily, you will not develop a cor uh, cavum septi pellucidi. The ventricle is mainly put in the guidelines to identify fetuses who have ventriculomegaly. And uh, again, this, there are a wide variety of abnormalities that manifest as ventriculomegaly. Obviously, you're going to want to look very carefully at the spine after you see ventriculomegaly and uh, identify the gentle upturn of the sacrum and make sure there are no myelomeningocele or whatnot. If you don't see the skin covering or you see a sac in the distal spine, uh, you may be able to identify a uh, open spina bifida, but as you probably are aware, the most sensitive way to identify uh, open spina bifida is to find that the cerebellum is uh, compressed in the small posterior fossa, giving it that C-shaped or banana shape. The cisterna magna is gone. You no longer see that nice biconvex margin of the cerebellum. This is a very uh, predictive sign of a Chiari II malformation. And if you see ventriculomegaly, I would strongly recommend you look carefully at the posterior fossa because uh, open spina bifida is one of the most common causes, single most common causes of uh, ventriculomegaly in the fetus. Now we have become somewhat complacent with how great the posterior fossa is for identifying the Chiari malformation, which as you know is almost always associated with open spina bifida. And in fact, the spine may be more difficult to uh, image than the posterior fossa. So we've gotten pretty used to looking at the posterior fossa for finding myelomeningocele. And even if the posterior fossa is normal, I would strongly recommend you do not become too complacent about looking at the spine. There are a number of abnormalities in the spine that can be seen with a normal posterior fossa.
that are unrelated to the Chiari malformation. And this image is uh, illustrating one of the most important ones. In this case, you see that there is no gentle upturn of the sacrum. Here's the iliac crest here. The distal spine is almost completely missing. This is a case of caudal regression. And you will not detect this unless you uh, make a point of imaging the distal spine in addition to the posterior fossa. The upper lip is something you can find in well over 90% of mid-gestation fetuses. Once you get a little practice, it's very easy to see. Um, about 75% of clefts involve the lip. Uh, the soft palate, as you know, has been a very challenging area for ultrasound. And we, for all intents and purposes, miss most of the soft clefts. But if you can find 75% by identifying the cleft in the lip, it would be very helpful both to parents and to enhance your search for additional abnormalities. Four chambers included in the chest, a uh, very important part of the exam. And when I say four chambers, I mean you need to count one, two, three, four. There have to be four identifiable chambers on an axial view of the chest. If you have an image like this, it's not going to fly. This, in fact, was an example of left ventricular hypoplasia with fibroelastosis, as you see here. And I would strongly recommend, if you can't get a four-chamber image of the heart, that you repeat the study. Cardiac anomalies are the most common fetal congenital anomalies. They're the ones that cause the most severe uh, mortality and morbidity, and really you should be able to get a four-chamber view on every obstetrical sonogram. So uh, out, outflow tracts are recommended, if technically feasible, in the AIUM guidelines, and I would like to emphasize this. Uh, I think we should make every attempt to get outflow tracts once your uh, imagers be, get familiar with this uh, imaging, it becomes very straightforward and very easy to do and can also be obtained quickly in an image very close to the one you use for your axial chest and your four chamber view. And in this particular image, you can nicely see that, um, let's see here, that you can see the RV outflow tract coming up here, crisscrossing with the LV outflow tract and the three vessel view just above that with the superior vena cava, the central aorta here, and the pulmonary artery in that line. Very important view. Uh, this view will increase detection of cardiac defects on the obstetrical sonogram from a baseline of a four-chamber view of about 40 to 50 percent detection to 75 percent detection. And I would strongly encourage your sonographers and yourself to become familiar with the outflow tracks and be able to obtain them in nearly every obstetrical sonogram. The stomach, the presence or absence of it, the cord insertion into the fetal abdomen and the cord vessels, you can see the cord insertion here. This excludes basically omphaloceles and gastroschisis, and the two arteries coursing around the bladder are pretty much all you need. The stomach should be a single fluid-filled structure. You shouldn't see a filled duodenum. If you see a filled duodenum, you must worry about some uh, form of duodenal obstruction. Obviously, if you see a big mass of liver herniated out at the ventral abdominal wall insertion, you would be thinking of an omphaloceele. And if you only see one artery coursing around the bladder, that would be sufficient to make the diagnosis of a two-vessel cord rather than a three-vessel cord, which, as you know, has a marginal increase in risk of anomalies. The renal region, including the urinary bladder, you take a quick look at the kidneys. Sometimes you can't see them quite this well. But if you have a filled urinary bladder and normal amniotic fluid volume, then you're pretty much assured you have at least one intact kidney, one intact ureter, and a functioning urinary bladder. 
If you see something like this, you would make the diagnosis of multicystic dysplastic kidney, but prognostically, again, if it's a unilateral multicystic dysplastic kidney, it wouldn't have great prognostic uh, implications as compared to a bilateral multicystic dysplastic kidney, which is basically like having being anephric and is considered to be a lethal abnormality. So the majority of cases that we do are standard obstetrical sonograms. These should be the workhorse of obstetrical sonography. The very minority of patients should be undergoing targeted obstetrical sonography. I hope this has helped you, and I think if you follow the AIUM guidelines, I feel very strongly they are very thoughtful guidelines, they are very helpful, and they will keep you out of trouble and help you do a very good job. Thank you very much.